Let's talk about colonial trade weapons. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatory. So this is just a little chat and perhaps a little introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with it, with the concept of colonial era trade weapons, more specifically often trade blades. But this also expanded to things like firearms as well. And we'll get onto that in a second. So this is inspired by some really cool knives that I've received from Ravensbeak Forge. Um, a link to um, them below. And you will know in the past that we've looked at tomahawks, and we'll come to tomahawks in a second from Ravensbeak Forge. Um, and uh, so he, Ethan, has a, a kind of a focus on Native American, or should we say North American, uh, traditional weaponry of the 18th and 19th centuries. However, this is a really, really interesting topic. So clearly in the colonial era, which really starts in the 16th century with the Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, English, French, and various other nationalities expanding out into different parts of the world. Now, obviously this includes the Americas, North, South, Middle America, also into Asia, Africa, um, and so on. Now, what's really interesting is obviously this is a clash of technologies. So what we find is that we uh, find Europeans going to places where the people living in those places, the indigenous people, didn't very often have access to um, blades of a type that were being mass produced in Europe. Now, in some cases, for example, if we take the Americas or Australia, um, or New Zealand. They didn't have access to any metal, really, except for copper, I suppose, in parts of America. But in most of America, they didn't have access to any metal at all. So what's really interesting is we find this phenomenon happening, and this is a great example of this, whereby when the Europeans turn up, there are things they want. There are, you know, furs and things like this, other natural resources that you want to get hold of, obviously gold in, in, uh, in, with the Aztecs and people like that. But there are things that the Europeans want and there are things that the indigenous people want. Now, one of the things that gets traded very, very early on is weapons. And even in a place which was awash with weapons, like Japan, that also happened there as well. So famously, that's how guns arrive, really, or certainly firearms, as they later became, uh, in Japan, is, um, you know, gun barrels for aquabuses and um, cannons and such like, and indeed armour, uh, breastplates and helmets were traded into Japan as well. But in Native America, one of the main things traded in were knife blades and axe blades. Now, what's interesting to me as someone who studies the development of weapons, whether it's knives or axes, and both of these are from Ravensbeak Forge, incidentally, and thank you <laughs> to Ravensbeak Forge for sending these. These are awesome. They also give me lots to talk about, and they're just really nice things to have and beautifully made. Um, one of the interesting things is that in America, for example, the Native Americans, the American Indians, basically adapted what they were being traded to their own sort of understanding of weaponry and expectations of weaponry. So axe blades replaced earlier stone or in some cases wooden headed war clubs and tomahawks that came before this. So obviously before this type of uh, trade axe arrived in the Americas, people were using stone headed axes um, and forms of war club. And fundamentally, they're not a very different weapon. You can use them in a very similar way. So this, not only as a tool, of course, being very useful, but as a weapon, this was very familiar to them and something they were very keen to get their hands on. Similarly, of course, they had previously been using knives that looked extremely like this, and the Eskimos, the Inuit in the North, continued using knives that looked very like this with flint, or in some cases, obsidian, depending where in America you were, flint, chert, or obsidian, in other words, stone blades. But fundamentally, it's the same thing. You've got a better blade now. You've got a steel blade, which, you know, it doesn't chip so easily and it's um, not going to snap if you uh, try and twist or bend it laterally if you're digging into something with the point or using it in combat. But very often they constructed hilt forms which were familiar to themselves and indeed scabbard forms as well. So in many cases, we find a lot of similarity between the resulting 18th and 19th century traded knife blades, uh, how they end up mounted on the hilt and the scabbard with styles that went before. And in some cases, there would be additional trade thing, things in here, for example, glass beads or other things which might come in mixed in with their own Native American cultural artifacts that would be 
added into decoration, necklaces, headdresses, all of this kind of stuff. Um, here's another example, incidentally, very similar thing, just a smaller version. And obviously, people would trade for the blades that they could. So obviously, the more furs or beavers or whatever they had uh, to trade, the more, the, you know, the bigger blade, the more fancy object. And something like this one here would be a particularly big blade um, to be traded. So you'd have to probably exchange barter quite a lot of things in return. These small utilitarian knives, uh, almost like a skin do um, from Scotland, would be a more affordable blade. And these would be treasured and handed down. So in many cases, when we look at Native American, um, artifacts, we actually find the blades on things that were still being used in the early 20th century, the blades themselves might go back to the 17th or 18th century and they've been used for generations and generations, remounted in different hilts and obviously different scabbards over time, decorated in different ways, perhaps even passed between different tribal groups as well. And we've talked a lot about tomahawks in the past and these come in various different styles. This is a really nice uh, forged um, sort of uh, teardrop section uh, socket on this type with a beautiful um, dark wood shaft. This is a fairly typical type of trade axe. Now, ironically, the Europeans who settled in North America, while they traded these that were based on European axes um, and very similar to boarding axes, in fact, that were used on board ships at the time, they traded these into the Americas. And then ironically, the European settlers actually ended up adopting these as sidearms. So if we look at the American Revolutionary Wars, uh, um, the War of Independence, Independence, breaking off from uh, Britain, uh, we actually see American riflemen commonly carried tomahawks. So by that point, what we think of as a Native American weapon had been in its modern, more sort of Europeanized form, been adopted by the European settlers. Um, and uh, in fact, they used them for um, as a hand weapon, they used them as tools, but they also used them for throwing as well. And we also know that the Native Americans used these for throwing, as they had done for centuries with their more indigenous forms of tomahawk with stone and wooden heads that have gone before this. Now, we've talked a lot about the Americas here, but of course, this applies to other areas as well. So an interesting example that has a parallel with the Americas to mention are the Maoris of New Zealand. Now, the Maoris had a quite a warlike um, tribal structure. There was a lot of inter-tribal warfare. And uh, there is an interesting parallel between the trade axe that comes into the Americas and the axe that was used in New Zealand. And in fact, wood chopping axes that look pretty much exactly like a wood chopping axe that you'd buy from the hardware store today were traded into New Zealand and were adopted by the Maoris, mounted onto longer shafts, almost like a Dane axe, like on the, uh, in the Battle of Hastings. And they often decorated the wooden shaft, but the head remained completely recognizable, even to a modern person, as a wood chopping axe. So, and they were, in fact, in 19th century sources referred to as tomahawks because this word tomahawk that came from the Americas, they looked at the ones being used in New Zealand and they went, well, that's a tomahawk as well. So completely different group of people, New Zealand, Maoris, their own distinctive culture, obviously some genetic uh, connection way, way back, but fundamentally a separate uh, culture in a very different place. And yet they had a very similar result due to European colonialism. They adopted the European axe head and mounted it in a traditional tribal way. Now, sadly for the Maoris, um, there was a, a downside to trading for European weapons because one of the things that they purchased a lot of were muskets. Um, so in the 19th century, the Maoris were liberally traded um, thousands and thousands of muskets. And this was something which was very disruptive to Maori culture and resulted in something known as the musket wars, uh, whereby tribal groupings who for hundreds of years had been fighting it out with axes and clubs and, and patus and other and spears and other types of hand weapons weapon um, and thrown spear now had muskets and they slaughtered each other uh, and certain dominant tribal groupings completely obliterated less dominant tribal groupings. So this is a good example and we see this in the modern world as well with the use of modern technology and not just rifles but you know missile systems and, and aeroplanes and tanks and things like that that sometimes a group of people suddenly massively subjugate another group of people because they've suddenly got access to a new form of weapon system uh, which enables them to uh, carry out war on a scale which they hadn't really been used to and their culture perhaps wasn't adapted to before that and there's nothing really there's no balance to hold that back from happening so sad that that happens but it happens throughout history and it has always happened and probably unfortunately will always happen so long as humans are humans and carry out war on each other
So that's New Zealand. If we go to Asia, the situation is somewhat different because, of course, as far as metal weapons are concerned, because um, metal weapons have been used in Asia and Africa for um, thousands of years, well, hundreds of years since the Iron Age. And um, if we go to India, for example, we do find, as I've mentioned in many videos in the past, we find European sword blades being traded into India. And we know that in the 17th century, for example, uh, and thereafter, 17th, 18th, 19th, uh, German sword blades, which were mass produced, were bought by the tens of thousands into India. The arsenal in Lucknow contained, I think it was about 7,000 German sword blades in, already in the 1600s, in the 17th century. And these, these were mounted into traditional talwar hilts, kanda, um, a putta, uh, all different types of in traditional Indian sword. Why? Well, a slightly different reason. It wasn't because they didn't have steel blades. In fact, they had su superior, they had fantastic steel blades in India. But the method of manufacture in India was very laborious, a bit like Japanese swords, not quite as much as Japanese swords, but it was a laborious process. Whereas, of course, the Industrial Revolution in Europe, in places like Britain and Germany and the Netherlands, meant that we could mass produce these blades and trade them with Indians and suddenly Indian people could buy vast numbers of good quality sword blades much more affordably than they could get good quality blades manufactured by Indian smiths. So it became economically viable and in some cases preferable to import sword blades rather than make them in country. And we see similar economic phenomenon in the modern world where yes we could make an iPad in the USA or in Britain but it would cost a vast amount more money because of labour costs and everything else uh, than it does do to get it made in China. Right, so uh, the situation is somewhat different therefore in Asia um, and, uh, and Africa and between those two there's a difference as well. So uh, blade production was big in most of Asia. So, so India did produce a lot of its own um, sword blades and knife blades and things like this, spearheads, as did places like the Philippines and obviously China and um, uh, obviously Japan and uh, Korea and various other countries in Asia. But if we come to Africa, there's a slightly different situation. Now, Africa absolutely has had iron blades and steel blades since the Iron Age um, and in fact famously you know there's there's in Egyptian tombs ancient Egyptian tombs there are meteoric iron uh, knife blades um, so this does you know even before the Iron Age so absolutely they've been around however in many parts of Africa good quality steel bla steel blades were not necessarily easy to come by so they were mining iron um, and they were working iron but again, there were some natural resources that they had access to, which it was easier for them to harvest those things and trade with Europeans for blades and guns. And this, very similar to New Zealand, it happened that you know they purchased muskets. So everybody thinks of Zulus, for example, as being predominantly armed with spear and shield, but they had a lot of muskets. Um, and in places like Ghana, the Gold Coast, they had huge numbers of muskets. Um, and so muskets were widely traded right the way across Africa, of course, along with the ammunition, the gunpowder and the lead uh, ball to go with them, um, and later on cartridge ammunition as well. So firearms were widely traded into Africa in return for natural uh, produce that they could um, mine or, or make and trade with Europeans. But here's a great example of something where trade goes in both ways. So this is a Sudanese cascara. Now the Sudan um, pretty much next to, butting up next to um, Egypt. So clearly they had had access to metal weapons for a long, long time. And um, they, right the way through the sort of Mamluk era of the Middle Ages, uh, some troops had, had been recruited from Sudan and, and they had, ac had access to, you know, iron and steel armour and weapons for, for centuries and centuries. And swords like this cascara had been around for a long, long time. Uh, probably the form of cascara that you see here probably comes around in about the 14th, 15th century in its original form and then in this final form probably the 16th, 17th century. Uh, but that's, op that's open for debate and we need to do more research on that. But Notice this blade. Now, what's interesting is the Europeans in this case, they didn't turn up in a place where they didn't have swords or didn't have sword blades. They did. They had cascara. But what they did is um, German merchants particularly, but also the Dutch and the British, 
turned up and went, well, okay, so you guys really like your swords. Every man carries a sword. You all practice sword fighting. You are a nation of swordsmen. So what we're going to do is we're going to trade swords with you. Uh, you give us, you know, things like crocodile skins and stuff that we want for, for our uh, industries in Europe. And we will give you sword blades again. And it's the German, particularly the Germans, the Solingen blade manufacturers, mass producing sword blades at a, at a volume and at a cost per unit that just couldn't really be competed with anywhere else, thanks to, again, the Industrial Revolution, due to machinery, due to things like trip hammers, drop hammers, steam power, and everything else. So they started mass producing these sword blades, and these sword blades were taken to Africa and traded with people like the Sudanese, the Tuareg, um, various people all over Africa, pretty much every part of Africa, um, German steel sword blades, and in some cases, French and British or Dutch, were traded with them for things that the Europeans wanted. So in many cases, these Cascara or Tacuba have European blades on them, sometimes Italian as well, actually. I should have mentioned the Italians because they should get credit in here as well. However, here's an interesting flip. Not only do many of these have German blades, but many of them have locally made African blades. And this, this is probably an Italian blade, actually, looking at it due to the markings. But there are examples of these Cascara and uh, Tacuba which actually have locally made blades in the style of the Italian and Indian, uh, sorry, the Italian and German blades, and British in some cases. So what's really interesting is they bought these blades from Europe because they were plentiful and they were being traded and they were great quality and nice and springy and all this kind of stuff. They looked at them and went, they're pretty good blades, so next time we make a batch of blades, we'll make them look like the European ones. So confusingly for antique dealers like me, sometimes these have European blades on, like this one, and sometimes they have African-made blades on in the European style. And finally, there's one other example, Afghanistan. Now, many of you will know that Afghanistan has been the, uh, the place where lots of armies have gone to uh, defeat themselves. Um, you know, the Russians, the British, many, many others. Um, and in many cases, the Afghans traded for weapons, but then they also then copied those weapons. So while the Afghans originally had either captured in battle or purchased and traded for things like Martini Henry rifles and later on Lee Enfield rifles and earlier than that muskets, they also locally made copies of them as well in places like Kabul and various other parts of Afghanistan, mostly in the cities. And there were areas where you could literally go and it, apparently still today, you can still do it, go and buy pretty much perfect, at least to look at, replicas of things like Lee Enfield rifles and Martini Henry rifles, and in fact also uh, in later years Kalashnikovs as well. Um, so they were replicating these. Now the Nepalese, uh, where the Gurkhas come from, they also did something similar. They captured um, British and Indian weapons and they copied them as well. So there are Nepalese, in the modern antique world, we find Nepalese copies of European weapons like uh, Enfield three band rifled muskets, for example. But you also find Afghan copies of them as well. Now, just because they look very uh, convincing, doesn't mean metallurgically they are always as good. And unfortunately, some people over the years have bought and shot Afghan and Nepalese uh, replica, essentially, rifles that have exploded on them because the steel quality is not so good. But they also copied other things as well, um, such as uh, types of sword and knife. Um, so really, the long, long history of uh, trading weapons to different parts of the world from Europe, or should we say the West, uh, trading it into um, less wealthy parts of the world is an incredibly long, I mean, it goes, it's a tale as old as time, isn't it? And let's face it, we know that there was some kind of trade of um, Bronze Age swords from Britain, for example. We found British made Bronze Age swords all over Europe. Um, so it goes back to the Stone Age, <laughs> possibly even before that. And it's still going on today as well. But it's a very interesting and complex topic for people like arms collectors and dealers like me. It's one that you need to educate yourself on to understand where something might have been made, even what it might look like. It might look like something from Africa. It might look like something uh, that's Native American, but it might have a partially European history or European heritage uh, to it. And it is a two-way flow uh, and a very interesting part of uh, man's, human's technological uh, and economic development and history.
Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. I hope this has been a interesting little detail from my normal format of videos. Um, and maybe we could do some deep dives uh, on the future in uh, particular weapons like I've done with Tomahawks. Maybe we could have some deep dives on some of the others where there is a shared European and non-European sort of ancestry to the development um, and history of those weapons. Any particular ones you want me to look at, of course, comment uh, down below. Um, and um, I hope I see you back on the channel really soon. And thanks once again to Ravensbeak Forge, link below uh, for these fantastic knives and tomahawks um, that uh, he sent me. So thanks for watching. I hope we see you back on the channel really soon. Take care, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.